Hanoff, a company that's going to present to us a very interesting uh, product. Um, first of all, let me say just a few words about um, accessibility and inclusion and technology. Um, this is the overall arching theme of our discussion, digital inclusion for uh, persons with disabilities and, and we will share a few different insights on this topic. One of the core principles of the Convention of the right, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was adopted by the General Assembly in 2006, is the full and effective participation and inclusion in society. The goal of inclusion signifies that we have to create environments that provide uh, access for all people on an equal basis. And the UN in general and the office uh, here, the uh, office in Geneva in particular, as a service provider, we house the Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities where we are very committed to implementing all standards and guidelines for the accessibilities of our facilities and uh, services. This is difficult work, this is slow work, for which we do not always have the expertise or the resources needed, but we are committed to making uh, progress and we strongly believe that technology will provide solutions, uh, if we can make it available to all. There was a remarkable exhibition that some of you may have seen uh, just a few weeks ago here at the Palais organized by UNICEF, I think, um, on assistive technology and its role in accelerating learning and participation of children with disabilities, where many organizations and companies displayed cutting-edge equipment. I was, uh, I was personally very, very inspired by this exhibition and the, the promises offered by artificial intelligence and other technological developments for accessibility, and, I'm, and I was particularly pleased that many of the companies which brought equipment came from the Global South. I'm very pleased, therefore, to pursue this exploration with you today. With the uh, broad range of experience that we have here, the topics we will touch upon include uh, uh, specialized software development, e-commerce, and accessibility. What we hope to illustrate by combining this, this subject is the importance of digital inclusion of persons with disabilities uh, to achieving the sustainable development goals and the opportunities in trade and development that can come through the use of new technologies and electronic commerce in this, uh, in this field. So let me now introduce our three distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, first, we have uh, Ambassador Diego Arestia Valencia, who is the permanent representative of Ecuador to the WTO and other economic organizations based uh, in Geneva, Mr. Ambassador Aristia has a very distinguished career in an ex extensive experience in public and development uh, economics as former Minister of International Trade, um, Director of the School of Governance at the uh, University uh, Universidad de los Hemisferios in Ecuador and many other very distinguished positions. Um, to my left, we have uh, we have, uh, I don't want to misspell your name, it's Pilar Fajarnes, who is Economic Affairs uh, Officer in the, uh, in the Technology and Logistics Division of Functad. And to uh, the far right, we have uh, Mr. Hugo Jacome, who is the co-founder and president of, of Talov, and I'll say a bit more about this later. But first of all, I'd like to give the floor to Ambassador Aulistia. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Momo Banya, Director of the Division of Conference of the UN Office in Geneva, uh, Mrs. Pilar Fajarnes from Harris uh, from Munta, and Mr. Roca Come. I'm fellow Ecuadorian co founder and president of TALO. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, Mrs. Momo Banya for your introductory remarks regarding the importance of inclusivity and accessibility for people with disabilities in the framework of human rights. Um, the issues related to accessibility have been a national priority in Ecuador for more than 15 years. The most visible advocate of this has been our current president, Mr. Levin Moreno. He requires a uh, to work his mobility, 
and who was also from 2013 until 2016 the special envoy of the UN Secretary for People with Disabilities. Um, <clears throat> Ecuador, along with Brazil and Paraguay, were the first proponents of consideration of exceptions in favor of people within the intellectual property system. That's more related to us, to the mission, to the economic organizations in Geneva. After eight years of negotiations at the World Intellectual Property Organization, the market, the market strength to facilitate access to published work for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled was adopted in June 2013 and entered into force in September 2016. This treaty permits the reproduction, distribution, and makes available published work in formats designed to be accessible to people with visual disability and permit exchange of these works across borders by organizations that serve those persons. The range of beneficiaries covered by the treaty are not only blind or visually impaired people, but those with a physical disability that prevents them from holding and manipulating a book, as well as those who cannot effectively read, read because of a visual, physical, perceptual development, cognitive or learning disability. During the harmonization process of the treaty with the national legislation, Ecuadorian citizens request to the state to extend, to extend the exceptions in order to protect and benefit people with any kind of disability. After taking into account the demands of its citizens in the national legislation, the Ecuadorian state decided to internationally support the idea of the creation of instruments that extend the benefits of the Treaty of Marrakesh to people with all kinds of disabilities. We hope that this will lead to a broader consideration of the needs of people with disabilities within the intellectual property system. This background is particularly valid to make the following introduction. Today, with great pleasure, we accompany the presentation of Hugo Jacome, the founder and president of an Ecuadorian firm, Talop. Hugo is part of a team of young entrepreneurs who have been able to create a startup with an essential social function and effect. This is an example of a company that goes further the financial aim any startup has. It contributes directly through its products to, ex to the exercise of human rights, in this case, for people with disabilities. Besides the primary responsibility of the state as a, guarantor, as a guarantor of the rights of citizens, it's crucial the development of private initiatives that includes, in the core side of, the mission, of their mission, activities contributing to the society. Business with ethical aims and strong corporate values can also have a positive impact in the corporate culture in which as market wealth, companies with solid values attract young people and have more possibilities to survive. In the frame of this event, e-commerce week, innovation is at the core of the discussion. Entrepreneurs require a favorable environment that can only be provided by making good use of the available policy space. Ecuador aspires to create the conditions in which young people not only use developable technologies, but make use of their knowledge to a greater degree. We, as a developing country, face many challenges with putting in place policies, mechanisms, and institutions to promote innovation. The digital and technological gap undermine the possibilities that our citizens have in the global market. This makes the effort made by these young entrepreneurs even more I would like to finalize recognizing, recognizing our deeply appreciation to the work of the UN system, people who have contributed and collaborated um, for this event to take place, and also with all the work that has the aim of reducing inequalities in the technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And now I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Bahan. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, as I am the representative of Punta in this event, and Punta is the organization behind the Holy Commerce Week, first of all, I would like to thank 
also our appreciation to the ambassador and the permanent representative mission of Ecuador in Geneva for partnering with us in this event and also the support of the United Nations office in Geneva. Uh, the work of UNTAD in relation to e-commerce and the digital economy is primary, primarily on supporting developing countries in maximizing the benefits that the, these processes can bring and at the same time, time supporting in addressing the challenges that may come. As part of the United Nations, basically our final of objective is in the context of the two, 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development Goals and our final objective is sustainable and inclusive development, which implies leaving no one behind. Uh, in the context of the United Nations, accessibility is not only an inner right, right of persons with disabilities, but is a means to ensure that they are able to exercise all their rights and that they are empowered to participate fully in society on equal terms with all others. In recent years, Persons with disabilities have gained voice in all spheres of life and development, and the approach to addressing disability in global policy has been shifting gradually. But despite all this progress in recent years, persons with disabilities continue to face significant barriers that uh, prevent them from being fully included um, in the society and to participate in the life of their society. It, this can be shown, for example, in the disproportionate levels of poverty, the lack of access to education, health services, lack of employment, and their underrepresentation in decision making and political participation. It is important to know that per persons with disabilities account for 15% of the world population. The vast majority of them are in developing countries. In recent years, there has been increasing recognition that no development path that would exclude the participation of persons with disabilities in the economic, social, or political life can be inclusive, equitable, or sustainable. The 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development and its 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals provide a powerful framework to guide local communities, countries, and the international community toward the achievement of, of disability in classic development. This agenda pledges to leave no one behind, as I mentioned before, including persons with disabilities and other disadvantages group, and has recognized disability as a cross-cutting issue, which means that there is no specific goal in this matter, but it is included in all the goals. The agenda also includes seven card targets and 11 indicators explicitly making reference to persons with disabilities. Discover access to education and employment, availability of schools sensitive to students with disabilities, inclusion and empowerment of persons with disabilities, accessible transport, accessible public and green space, and building capacity of countries to disaggregate data by disability. In the context of the SDG, technology is a very important uh, question to consider, and it is at the same time a target and a facilitator for the goals. In this way, it is important to facilitate access to and sharing accessible and assistive technologies to advance disability in classic development, ensure accessibility for persons with disability, and promote their empowerment. The presentation that we have today by Talon is an application for deaf and blind people and is a very good illustration of what I, I have been saying and how this can, can be done. This application is a contribu contribution in the path to ensure that a significant part of the world population can benefit from accessibility, accessibility services that help to progressively remove barriers towards a full and effective participation of persons with disabilities in social life and development. And it is also important to note that this presentation is an example of the opportunities that electronic commerce and the digital economy can provide to small enterprises in developing countries. And I will end here because the most important thing is the demonstration that we will have. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Yes, indeed. And we come to this now.
And uh, so again, I think a lot has been said already about Alo, so just to repeat that it's an Ecuadorian uh, startup that has developed a software to help deaf people to communicate through a technological platform. And without further ado, we will hear from uh, Mr. Hugo Hakome, its co-founder and, and president. Mr. Uh, Mr. Hakome, you have the floor. Hi everyone, I'm very happy to be here and uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I am Hugo Hakome, I am part of TALOF team. We were concentrated in how to tackle challenges related to accessibility and technology. And we will start with some numbers. Did you know that every hour, 1,004 deaf people and 620 blind people born in this world, every hour. And these people uh, obviously wants to study, wants to include, be included in society, wants to, uh, to go to a supermarket, wants to make a normal life. But um, there are some, uh, like, uh, like he said, some challenges, like daily life challenges that we try to solve through technology. And uh, let's see, in the world there are 470 million deaf and hard of hearing and 290 million blind and low vision people. Every time, like I, I told you, they face a challenge in every day. And uh, how to face these challenges? For example, uh, speaking about the UNSDG, less than 5% uh, goes to school because institutions are uh, often not well prepared to teach people with any kind of disability. Uh, some expenses, some hearing and vision aids can cost up to one hundred thousand dollars. It's not uh, accessible for uh, everybody. And the combined with others and hearing and vision impairment annual global cost is one thousand four hundred billion dollars. This is like the double of the GDP of a country like Switzerland every year. This is the cost uh, of uh, another security loss because they are not in the job circuit, in the educational circuit. So we have to tackle this. And uh, we use a tool that is a very, like, very common to hear nowadays, the artificial intelligence. And I have uh, used this, this graphic because it's like the first thing that every, everyone imagined when I told uh, artificial intelligence, like, wow. But artificial intelligence are uh, some com uh, cognitive computing techniques that try to emulate the processes inside the human brain um, and make a computer start to learn uh, similar, not equal, I think will never be equal, but similar uh, to a human being. So, uh, this is compatible with inclusiveness, of course, of course, uh, because uh, the sign language interpreters and the people that is always helping blind people, the guidance for blind people, uh, it's not available 24-7 in some cases could be very expensive. But considering unlimited resources and unlimited availability, there is still one trouble, privacy. Yeah. In many cases, we don't, we don't want uh, third party people uh, listening our conversations or just being in a very private moment. So that's the, that's the place where technology can help. Our, uh, our dream and our, our perspectives are never replace human uh, assistance for blind and deaf people, never. But 
Our dream is to give more independence for challenge those daily life problems to people with disabilities. We have to be very clear of that because in some scenarios, uh, many people that is related to sign language interpretation have told us things like, uh, you are going to take off our job. No, technology will never take off your jobs. We are just trying to help in the daily life and because you are a human being, you cannot be 24-7 with another people. You have your life, your kids, you have to eat. You cannot be like a machine every time, but technology can do that. So, uh, we have uh, launched uh, two apps. The first one is Speedlist, designed uh, for people uh, with hearing impairment, uh, because uh, this uh, app, through using a sensor that I have here in my my right hand, it's like a small watch, can detect sign language and convert them in real time to voice and text in 35 languages. For example, if I am Ecuadorian, I use Ecuadorian sign language, but what if I am in Thailand? I just choose the output in Thailandese, in spoken Thailandese. So, uh, can understand sign language. We have launched that right now with a North American Sign Language first, and we will be adding more sign languages uh, within the days. Because there, there is one very curious thing about uh, sign language. Uh, for example, in Ecuador we speak Spanish, but the Spanish is slightly different from city to city. From one province to another we have some small differences call it like accents, could be. And um, in sign language, is the same. Ecuadorian sign language is different to Venezuelan sign language, to Switzerland sign language, to Chinese sign language. And even in every region of every country, you can find variations. So that's a very big challenge that we have to solve through artificial intelligence, to hyperparametrization and generalization of the neural networks. So, uh, for example, the speed list, uh, I, I cannot uh, uh, connect the wirelessly the, the, the screen of, of the phone to the, to the projector, but I, I, will, I will explain to you. Speed list have four functions. The first one is to convert the voice of human beings in text, in real time and in 35 languages. For what? Because if, if I am deaf, and um, I am in this, uh, in this room, in a meeting, I definitely want to know what is people speaking around me, but I cannot hear them. So Spiglis assist me transcribing and converting all the conversations to voice. Then also I can make, uh, I can text like in a WhatsApp or Messenger app and convert those, uh, those texts, including emoticons, to a voice, to a synthesized voice, and connect to Bluetooth speakers so everybody can hear me. Now I have a voice. The other feature is, for example, to analyze the sound surroundings. If I am uh, on the street and uh, an ambulance comes uh, with high speed with the siren on, uh, everybody can be alert, but for deaf person this is impossible. So analyze the sound surroundings and tell people alert. Ambulances, dogs, people, birds, I don't know, any kind of uh, sounds. It's called computer audition, like computer vision. It's also a technique called computer audition. And the other one that I uh, would like to try, um, and I think can be heard through microphone, it's for example, uh, to convert sign language to, to voice through this sensor. I don't know, can you hear the... <laughs> okay, so we are, we are okay. For example, in American sign language I can say things like... Ah, it's with the... Let me... Right now. So let, let's try again. What's the, the sound level down? Hello, how are you? My name is Hugo. I live in Ecuador.
in that in that way, I can be a typical user of sign language and have no barriers to come any place, any building, any supermarket, anything, and use my native sign language and just communicate with everyone. Because now, something that happens is that I am a, a sign language user, I go to a supermarket, I use my native language, and almost nobody can understand me. So I, I think that is annoying. It's really frustrating to use my native language but kind of be understood. Okay? So um, this is one app for uh, deaf people. And the other app that we have is Speakless Vision. It uses uh, artificial intelligence in real time to help blind people to identify, for example, objects, uh, calculate approximate distances, read text, designs, and more. Both apps are available in 35 languages. That's why uh, many or most of our uh, users are, for example, in China, Arabia, some countries of Europe, Asia Pacific, and Latin America, but not so much Latin America like Asia Pacific, for example, or Europe. So uh, let's see, for example, uh, here I have, I think, yeah, now you can see my phone. And let's try, for example, speakless vision. Now, speak these visions have uh, four features. Let me try better in English. I think it could be better. Um, okay. Now I think it's better. Now you can see, right? Yeah. And speakless vision, for example, uh, scan the sound surroundings and tell uh, blind people what is happening around. For example, let's see, just uh, scan something and try it, for example. Desktop computer 0 0.21 meters. Yeah. It can understand the environment and it can detect thousands of objects until even the distance to that object. So it's a complement for, for some tools that they already use. But uh, we, through artificial intelligence, tell uh, this object at this distance. It's like having a human guide. Not so complete, obviously, but it helps. They have, uh, have all the other features like multi-object, can read text in uh, 35 languages also. For example, the bus routes, uh, the name of the streets, and, and any kind of, of that. Um, and, uh, for example, our team now are uh, six people. The founders are Carlos, CEO, Hugo President, and Lenin uh, Harper VP, Juan AI VP, Hamilton Software VP, and Gustavo in General Counseling. We work uh, for this 1,004 and 620 hour deaf and blind people. Uh, and uh, we have uh, we have started in a very small office in Barra, three of us, with uh, a lot of challenges because being in a development country, making uh, top edge artificial intelligence technology could be, in some cases, like contradictory. <coughs> but uh, even with those challenges, uh, we tried to, to make something big from the scratch. So we had a dream, we quit uh, our jobs, we were uh, university professors, but we quit, we, we sold many of uh, our stuff. To be financial, to be a financial support to this startup, and uh, one very, very big challenge, is like like Ambassador said, in in uh, developing countries, is for example access to technology, access to capital, and uh, in in Ecuador, yeah, we, we have made some things, but always uh, is uh, a lot of things to do. So 
in Latin America in general, this is something that we have to tackle uh, from the public and private institutions to um, to strengthen the ecosystem, not to be like isolated initiatives and, and try to, to walk to the technology and entrepreneurship path. No, we have to make like another territories that can uh, that have been consolidated at one big effort from private and public institutions. So um, we started like like that, and uh, we had uh, some achievements like one the among 6.6 thousand applications, the first prize in Ecuador biggest startup contest in 2017. Then we were part of the pitch group in Web Summit 2018, 2017 among 90,000 applications. These, these were uh, sponsored by Mercedes-Benz. Then we won six stars, local edition of Ecuador in 2018. And uh, actually, we classified to the world finals that are this Friday, 5th in Lausanne. That's why we are here in Switzerland. Uh, because we are looking for talent for more opportunities and for access to investment and more technology. So we hope everything will be good in that competition. Then we won the SAP in the marathon in Ecuador and we were qualified to the US contest where we won the third uh, place. Winning a very important partnership with SAP and all their technology to improve our AI platform. Uh, in the in the, in the, the meantime, we have uh, been selected by IBM, like a premium startup. So they joined us to um, power our AI platform, our artificial intelligence platform. And thanks to IBM, we can now make things like this, uh, that is called uh, inference inside a phone. We have to remember, a phone is not a very powerful computer or processor. But uh, making a lot of optimization of code we can make that a phone with a tiny processor can't uh, think like a human. Uh, but uh, our, most, our most important uh, achievement is definitely to change a life. And let's see a bit. Muito feliz e muito grata que sempre se anelava a ter isso com ele, poder lhe dizer muitas coisas que de nada tu não sabia. Poder ver com meus irmãos, se relaciona com muitas pessoas sem nenhum problema, com tanta facilidade, poder ver como é que agora vai para o mercado ou a la tienda e se dá a entender o que ele quer, é dar um grande. Agora já ele se comunica com todos os demais, sabe o que estamos conversando com os outros na família. Muchas gracias, Spiglitz. Muchas gracias, Spiglitz. Gracias. So, this is our today's traction. This is our map. The yellow countries is where Spiglitz and Vision have been downloaded. Uh, we have now, with a Spiglitz for Dev, a free version, more than 6,000 users in 79 countries. And uh, with a Speakless Vision launched uh, two months ago, more than 200 users in 20 countries. But now we are uh, going to a model that is subscription model because we have to make this sustainable through time. Yeah. So um, we have uh, subscriptions plans like Netflix or Spotify, a monthly, annual, and forever plan that are accessible um, for, for people and that confirms our e-commerce platform because we use uh, Play Store of Android and App Store uh, for iOS to sell our goods. And that, uh, in, in, in that way, we have some like uh, curious stories because, for example, in the first, we cannot commercialize from Ecuador in Play Store, in Google. So we were like, Oh my God! Now we develop everything that we cannot sell. What we have? What we have to do? And so we start tweeting like crazy to Google CEO, and uh, and I think I don't know. It, it was a coincidence, but uh, like seven days later, that the Ecuador was included in the list to be to, to kind of commercialize software through Play Store. So um, we think that this uh, this model of uh, electronic and digital commerce. 
uh, it's one of the key features for the future of commerce. For example, regarding to the quantity, our, our market size, from those grand total of uh, 470 million deaf and 290 million blind, we have a grand total of 760 million people with disabilities. According to, uh, according to ITU, 30% of them have a smartphone. We are talking about 230 million people. And this can represent a market of 14 billion every year, considering subscription plans. It's just numbers to project how big is this and how much attention we have to pay in these digital tools, especially to solve a social issue. It's technology with a warm purpose. It's not just called technology. We are changing lives. And that is the real purpose of technology, of human studies, and every improvement, improvement in the society have to go to improve life. Definitely, there are no other ways. So, um, this is uh, our technology, and I appreciate very much uh, your attention, and I thank you to you, and invite you to make together a more inclusive world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugo, uh, for this very impressive uh, demonstration and for making it also part of a wider discussion and putting it in the, in the wider context. And maybe if I can take uh, uh, the privilege of being in the chair to start with the first question, because I'm sure there will be uh, many. But when you talk about uh, subscription, a subscription model for, uh, for, the, for the application, uh, would you think of uh, differentiating uh, prices uh, according to the level of income in the various countries where you would be uh, selling subscriptions? Yeah, we can make uh, all of that. Our, our today's plans are for with $99, $4 with 99 cents monthly, 39 with 99 annual, and 149 with 99 cents for lifetime. But yeah, we can make some differences, uh, even uh, like uh, with a geographic concept. Yeah, of course we consider that, but in the meantime, uh, for the first stage, we have to um, we have to return the initial investment that we have done for develop all this technology, and then we we when we go massive, obviously we plan to low cost and make it even more accessible. Thank you. Thank you for that. And now I would like to open to other comments by other panelists or questions from the floor. I have many other questions, but I want to give everybody a, a chance. Uh, actually, first of all, I want to, uh, to congratulate you. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, uh, as Mrs. Momalmanian uh, said, it's very impressive when actually it's possible to see the, the application working. Otherwise, you know, it's it's just kind of uh, kind of cold looking or reading about it. But once that uh, you did a very very short demonstration, I think it's, it's absolutely impressive. And that brings us to a couple of issues that I would like to, 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 to highlight and actually to, to, to ask you. One, you say this is about removing barriers. However, the whole the digital world in itself. It poses some challenges regarding barriers. The digital divide between developing countries, developed countries, between the people that do not have a home, or people that uh, are fortunate enough to, to have or could uh, afford a, a phone, number one. And, and number two, probably to expand a little bit, if you can expand a little bit, the way in which you commercialize. You say that actually that depends or that was a decision of a large company. So why we, we, why they were not allowing at the very beginning to commercialize the, the, the application or what was required? There was probably something which is more related to the uh, to the industry itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I, I will start from the last. Uh, yeah, regarding to, to those uh, like barriers that big companies set to some countries. Uh, we have not uh, very clear information about the exact uh, reasons, but for example, uh, usually large companies uh, consider tiny markets, for example, like Ecuador. Ecuador is a tiny country, and 
of course, is a tiny market. So uh, we were out of Google Store, like commercialized. You can upload any app to Play Store, but in the beginning, you cannot uh, put a price. You have to upload free. Okay, that was the, the, the main barrier in the, in the, in the beginning. And uh, we think that many of that things are, are due to that the developing countries, of course, are considered that like uh, with uh, poor access to technology. But uh, we think that the uh, internet, that the smartphones, uh, with a lot of competitors like, like this, for example, I have now the, here an iOS and an App Store and an Android device. Uh, Android devices are definitely like low in cost and being more accessible to a lot of people. Uh, I think that now big companies are considering these tiny markets like, uh, like a market, like a real market. That's why Ecuador wasn't locked. I don't know if uh, because of our many tweets, <laughs> I don't know if I was very annoying to the CEO of, of, of Google, but uh, we are being considered because the penetration of internet is every day growing. And these devices uh, are uh, going down in terms of uh, access to, to them, the cost. And we think that in a couple of years, uh, it will be very common to have a smartphone even in those called development, developing countries. Uh, that's why we are uh, going through both uh, stores. iOS store is considered more in high-end countries, for example, in high developing countries. But Android is more common in, uh, in all the world. So we are going in, in the two platforms. And uh, yeah, we are now using those platforms because are they both, uh, both are the biggest competitors in terms of uh, mobile devices. Uh, so we are just going to, to the uh, I don't know if it would be, if it would be someday possible to have our own store. It's possible. But now we are taking advantage of the today's platform, very strong platforms, to reach a lot of people, the most possible people. Yeah. Thank you, and, and, and we, you, you did mention the, the sort of real life challenges that entrepreneurs uh, uh, like you can, can, can meet in commercializing their, uh, their uh, software products, and this is something that I'm sure that uh, Untad uh, is working on. Uh, do you have a question, Pilar, and comment? I have a couple of questions, and maybe with the first one, depending on the answer, I have a comment. <laughs> the first one is related to, because the, you are a small enterprise, I understand, and I saw that you talk about the team, but it said the founders, six people. Is this the whole company, or you have employers? Okay, founders uh, are three people, and in total we are six people. Now we are six, and seven with a part-time. We are a very tiny company. Actually, if you count uh, like yeah. how many we're here, it's all my company. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> then my suggestion comes, and probably because we are talking about the classicness, since I'm forecasting that you are such an interesting application that you will have a lot of first sex and we, you will expand, I would suggest that you look at women. Because you have only men. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's uh, something uh, we would like to have women in our team and uh, even uh, people with disabilities. We have uh, searched a lot for, but for example, in our country, we didn't find people with disabilities with, uh, with the profile of uh, software engineering or something that, that we really need in the first stage. And uh, yeah, we actually will start working in a couple of days after my return to Ecuador with a woman that is, a, is expert in terms of uh, UX. So we are very happy about that. My second is more technical. It's related because all of the analysis we do, we know that the digital economy is based on data. And we know a lot about what data do for with uh, the problems that they create with big companies, the big platforms, and all these things. But we know that data are also very useful to increase efficiency of a small company. I would like to know how you use your data, how it helps you in your process, 
uh, if you can explain, because we don't have that much information about what small, small companies do with the data. Yeah, of course. For example, a daily example, uh, it, it's the love uh, regarding to data. We can monitor 24-7, every second, uh, how many users we have at that time. In the, in the office, we have a, a, a screen, a TV, mm -hmm. with a world map. And we are looking, yeah, that is the same world map, but uh, every time uh, it uh, turns up a light, China, India. Thailand, Ecuador, North America, Iceland, every time. So we know uh, with that data the real-time usage of our app. Obviously, uh, we ask for users to register, so we have their, uh, their demographic data. We have uh, some information that we obviously uh, protect a lot to set up, for example, uh, the best strategies and which features of the app we have to improve because they, uh, they showed us, for example, 30% of people is using more the single object feature of speedless vision because of that technical reason. So we uh, take all that information and go to the code to improve and try to answer that uh, concerns about the users. So that is our today's usage of data. We are not, obviously, we are not a, a Google a data recollector, but uh, we use that uh, data specific to users and how they use, how they interact, and how we can use that to improve all the platform. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments? Yeah, I have a from the floor. Uh, thank you for the coming in this uh, meeting. I found it very interesting and informative. Uh, thank you all the panelists. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, there is no one size fits for all. This is crystal clear for everybody. And for those who are not attending this meeting, I think that they do, they do not understand the importance of this issue. Okay. This is my understanding. It's very important. Because in terms of the people, disrespect people with some disabilities, this era opens up new opportunity for them to have access to the market. And at the same time, it could be uh, very beneficial to the government as well. It is win-win policy. My request is that in order to uh, have a request maybe from the island, you know, to prepare something with the best practices, and also this application was very uh, interesting. And also some policy framework that you know everybody can can have their own takeaway from that, and to incorporate you know this issue into in, into the uh, e-commerce policy, and then it takes you know these people on board because sometimes these people are looked at you know the people that you know put burden of expenditure on the shoulder of the government. But when we have the policy making, you know, we include yeah. and incorporate this issue in the policy issues of the, at the government level. They, they can provide, you know, this, the policy space for these kind of people, and then they can provide, you know, such kind of application for them, and they, they, can, they, 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 they can reach to self sufficiency. And this, you know, reduce the burden of the government, and at the same time give them opportunity to have access to the market, and also give them, you know, the, 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 the high sense of the confidence that they can have to share the market. At this point, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I may then ask again one question. You have already obviously been very successful in your year. You have received many awards. Uh, you have partnerships with the, with the SAP, with IBM, but what do you think other entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs like uh, like you, uh, but who may not have had the same success and who want to uh, really develop uh, software for uh, accessibility that promote inclusion? What are the two things that they need most, either from their government, for from international frameworks? What are the two things that would help them the most 
make, make uh, their uh, products available everywhere. Okay, um, I will divide my, 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 my thoughts in two very important parts. Something is what uh, we need from the external, like uh, the government. So, um, I think that we really need uh, very clear, like regulations, uh, regulations that always help to companies and private capital to uh, to to conduct or to to drive those uh, funds to to entrepreneurs, but. Uh, I think in Latin America and also in all uh, countries of the world, regarding to something very internal that entrepreneurship uh, need or the entrepreneur needs is persistence. We started this 12 years ago. So the results that are here started with a research process in 2007. And uh, always we think that if we start something, we have to expect results in the next month. And that is uh, incorrect. So uh, I think that entrepreneurs need to understand that uh, if you want to build something big from the scratch, you have to be able to renounce to everything and start from zero. And uh, Tirelessly. <laughs> so uh, that is very important. And if the entrepreneurs and the society in general have this mindset, I obviously know that uh, if uh, representatives of that society in governments and everything have the same mindset, we cannot expect results. For example, I, I, I am giving uh, an example. I don't know <coughs> UN or or any related. Uh, uh, government or, or um, organism, organization uh, make some regulatory changes and we have to expect results in three months with a lot of startups and a lot of success. No, not really not. It's a long path that uh, requires a lot of effort, a lot of coordination from private, uh, from public, from civil society, from everybody. That I, I see the, 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 the challenge like this. It's like education coordination, uh, a lot of effort, patience, and persistence, resilience. Thank you, I mean, I think that's a, that's a good lesson for all of us, <laughs> frankly. But uh, thank you very much. If, is there any other comment or question from the floor? I, I, will, I will give the, the floor back to the panelists for one last uh, word. Uh, for my part, I really want to uh, thank the Mission of Ecuador for organizing this uh, this very, very interesting uh, presentation. I, I like very much what you said about this being a warm technology, you know, technology with a purpose. Uh, I want to also just remind everybody that there's a lot that is being done in Geneva for uh, for uh, people with disabilities, both from a rights uh, perspective with the Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities, but from also, as you said, Ambassador, uh, from an intellectual property uh, point of view, from technology through the ITU, so we have WIPO, ITU, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, so there's a lot of things happening uh, on TAD. What I feel sometimes is missing is connecting all of them, um, and uh, this is something that we have to work uh, harder on. Um, so really thank you uh, Hugo and thank you so much for coming all the way to present this uh, to us and best of luck with uh, for the future. Uh, and then maybe we start with you for one final, final word, then uh, Pilar and then the ambassador will close it. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, thank you again for all of you for being here. Uh, my, my message, last message could be uh, we have to work every day thinking in uh, making the, the good for the other people. So I think that is the principle, the, the, the main principle of life. If you give, you can expect to receive something someday, but you have to start to give. So uh, we started 12 years ago to give and we will not stop for continue giving 
and our dream is uh, one day, not very long in the future, but uh, because we have wait 12 years, 12 years for this, but uh, to be in a country that even I don't know and see a, a deaf person or a blind person like communicating or walking through the street without barriers, in that day, I would uh, say for my internal, okay, the job is done. But until that, no, we will continue tirelessly without stopping to work for this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Muchas gracias, embajador. Muchísimas gracias, Hugo, particularly because it has been a very good illustration. It really met my expectation. I was not very clear what it was coming up, not very much. I'm an analytical person, but on economic aspects, but it really saw this question of inclusive and sustainable development for people with disabilities, persons with disabilities, and at the same time, what is also more the focus of our work of how a small company can really go sporting in the world through the digital economy. So I really appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Hugo. Actually, I'm extremely proud, of course, being this an Ecuadorian, an Ecuadorian company, I think that uh, it says a lot about the, the, the capabilities and the, um, and the potential. It, it's true that there is a lot of potential, but it's well true that we need an active public policy to, to pursue uh, the development of those startups. And uh, you say very well, it, there is the need of a coordination. This has been a work of 12 years. The, the first thing that comes to my mind beyond, of course, the tenacious and the, and the persistence of, the, of this enterprise is how many companies, how many uh, small, medium-sized enterprises have fallen in the, in the way. And I think that that is a very, very uh, clear example of the need of uh, treating the, the industry of the digital economy as an infant industry with an active public policy. And uh, actually, it, it was mentioned that um, it's so important the need of having a policy space and an active public policy to take advantage of these opportunities. It's not, you know that there are opportunities. We have to take advantage and clearly there is a huge digital divide when you look at the figures in the world scale of the number of companies that have uh, business above one billion dollars. Uh, Latin America and Africa is 0.1% of the whole world, which means that 99.9% .9 is not neither in Latin America nor in Africa. So hopefully you will be adding to those figures in the, in the near future. But uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy of, uh, of this presentation. I'm very proud. And again, uh, once again, thanks to, uh, to the UN, to UNTA for, for making this possible. Uh, Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thank you.